anxious to get here today. I was studying. I wanted to read you a little something before I get started because I want to show you something if I can about uh, if you do good to people, if you'll be kind to people, it comes back home to you. And I want to show you a little story that tells it like it is. Many years ago, a young Scotman was going home from work. On his way home, he saw a young boy caught in a quicksand, and at the risk of his own life, he saved the boy from the quicksand. Afterwards, he took the young boy home, and when he got there, he was amazed at the big mansion he lived in. The father of the boy was so glad he wanted to reward the young man, but the young man refused, yet the rich man persisted and finally said, if I can't reward you, let me do something for your family. Finally, the Scotchman agreed to let the rich man uh, help his son send his son to college. His son went to college and studied medicine. The name of that young man was Alexander Fleming, the one who discovered a new medicine. The story doesn't end there, though. The son of the wealthy man who had been rescued also grew up and went off to war. There he fell sick, even to the edge of death. At last, the new vaccine the Scotsman's son had discovered reached this young man's son, and he was made well. This young man's name was Winston Churchill. I read that story, and I thought about something. Me and my wife was building our house over the Lake Place, and this didn't have anything to do with the message. I just want to show you something. If you're a blessing to people, it'll always return to you. And we were building our house over the lake, and when we was clearing the property, about, I'd say, a half a mile up the road from us, this little lady, I, she's probably 65, 70 years old, she came down the road, and she walked through the property and said, I hear you the pastor that lives here. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, would you care if I went down by the dock? The first thing I built on the property was my dock and out on the lake. And she said, would you care if I go down on the dock and meditate every morning? And I said, I'd be glad for you to do so. And she would come down every morning about 8 o'clock. She would come by, wave at me, go down, read her Bible, and pray on my dog, and sit down there. And uh, every once in a while, uh, my, grand, my daughter-in-law, uh, when my son came over to visit one day, and, and uh, my wife told her, she said, kick that rock over there. And uh, she kicked this little rock over, and under it was a note. And she said, what is this? She said, read the note. And it was from that little lady. Every time she'd come over, she'd leave a little note praying for us for something. And uh, she was a, a, a Mennonite, her and her husband. And uh, as time went on, I started building my house and laying the blocks and everything on the house. And I was doing it right by myself. And she came by one morning. She said, Pastor, could my husband come work for you? I said, ma'am, I don't have the money right now. I'm just paying for everything as I go. She said, oh, he don't want no money. He just wants something to do. And I said, well, tell him, come on in. And so he, every time I'd, I'd come to work over there trying to lay the blocks and everything, this guy would show up, and he would mix the mud for me. He would take care of the tooling and floating of the blocks. He helped me put my roof on. He helped these, and I'd try to pay him. I said, now, I got to pay, and I ended up paying him, by the way. I'm not a cheapskate, all right? I give him a dollar. But uh, uh, anyhow, uh, it was such a blessing. And he, he could make things that I wouldn't even think about. He does things I couldn't even think about. Now, you think about that. Just a word of kindness, and it returns back to you. 
and it always does, folks. We're living in a, a time, uh, and the reason I said that, one of the reasons I, I wanted to say that was because we're reading, we're living in a time that everybody's got a chip on their shoulder. They're just everybody's angry. Everybody's mad about something. You know, just a little kind word there once in a while. The Bible says, turns wrath away. And it'll come home to you. God will be good to you because of it. Now, I'll get to our message, if I could, please, uh, to 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn over with me. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to begin to read verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with the corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto an unfighted love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as a grass, and all the glory of men as a flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now, take that with me, please, and turn over to the book of Job. Job, <coughs> excuse me. Job chapter 19 and verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Though my reins be consumed within me. <coughs> now, I want you to take these verses for just a minute. If you'll study the book of First Peter, you'll find three very clear statements concerning the fact and significance of the death of Christ, and each statement emphasizes a different aspect of his death. For instance, in chapter 2, verse 24, declares the sacrificial nature of his death. In chapter 3, verse 18, states the substitutionary nature of his death. In chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, presents the redemptive nature of his death. Now, there's great meaning and importance in the names of our Lord. For instance, Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 says he is our Savior. In John 10 verse 11 he is our Shepherd. <coughs> In John 10 uh, 13 in verse 13 says he is our Master. In Proverbs 18 verse 24 he is our friend. And at least 3400 years ago Job spoke of Jesus our Lord as my Redeemer in Job chapter 19 verse 25 through 27. Now Redeemer or redemption means three things. Number one, it means to buy back or to purchase something that has temporarily been forfeited. Number two, it means to set free, to liberate as setting a slave free from slavery. Number three, redeemer or redemption means to deliver from some great danger. Now when Jesus, our Lord, died upon the cross, he redeemed us in a threefold sense by shedding of his blood. 
Number one, he bought back that which had been temporarily forfeited. In Romans chapter 7, verse 14, it says, By nature we were sold under sin. Adam, uh, by nature we're sinners. I say to everybody that I come in contact with trying to lead them to the Lord, I say the first thing you've got to realize is that you're a sinner. And what they go by, they say, well, I didn't do nothing that bad. I hadn't killed anybody. I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't committed. And they'll go tell me all the things they haven't done. And they put sin in categories. But you know, I come back to this side. Did you know you don't have to tell a child how to lie? Do you know that? You ever notice a little baby in a crib? You feed him with a bottle and you stuff him flat full of a bottle and two minutes later he's crying for more bottles. You liar, you already fool. <laughs> Who taught him to lie? He was born with that nature. You've got to understand something now. I'm very serious about this. You were born into sin. You are nature by birth. It come to our blood system. Now listen very carefully. First of all, Jesus bought back from up for us this temporary forfeited by nature that we're sold under sin. We're sold under the bondage of Satan, 1 Timothy 2.26 says. Shut up under condemnation, John 3, verse 18. Jesus died to pay the ransom price for to free us according to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 through 20. Number two, Jesus set us free from slavery and bondage. Because John 8 in verse 34 states, By nature we were slaves of sin and Satan. Jesus delivered us, number three, from a great danger. By nature we face death and judgment. John 3, 36. Our destiny then was hell. But Christ died to deliver us from all this. In 1 Peter 1, verse 18 to 21, tells us four things about our redemption. Number one, the plan of our redemption. Now look at 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, in verse 20. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now notice the plan of redemption. Notice our redemption was planned by God in eternity past. What is so comforting about this to me is God is working to a plan. God has a plan. God is never caught by surprise. He's got a plan. God has a plan for our redemption. So the atoning, the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ was so uh, was no afterthought with God. Redemption was from God from time and all eternity past. Number two, the purpose of our redemption. God's purpose of redeeming us, you and I, mankind period Jesus came and died and shed his blood number one to recover us from our enemy Satan number two to translate us translate us under the image of his dear son Colossians 1 verse 13 and to forgive us of our sins Mark chapter 2 and verse 10 and to cleanse us 1 John 1 7 and to take us to heaven John 14 that's God's purpose of redemption God redeemed us from our sins. The price of our redemption. <clears throat> Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your conversation received a tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Every once in a while, I told this story the other day, but every once in a while, uh, as a judge in town sends people out here that has to do community service uh, because of something they've done, and the judge sent them out here to do the community service, and this one man came out one day, and he said, Now, uh, Pastor, I'm a businessman. My time is very precious. And he said, I make a lot of money. My time is precious. 
and he said, here's, a, here's $500. If you'll just sign my sheet, I'll give the church $500. If you'll just sign my sheet, then I don't have to spend my time here. I said, but it ain't the way it works. The judge is sending you to teach you something. And I got news for you. I know people that think they can give enough money to the church. They can do enough good works. They can do all kind of things. Uh, that They can work their way into heaven. You can't work your way into heaven. Why? Because your purchase price was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not by works. The proof of our redemption. How do we know that this is true? Someone I talked to just here about a while back came up to me and said to me, how can I know that I'm saved? How can I know that uh, I'm going to live, redeemed, saved by the grace of God? There's three quick ways. Number one, the historical proof. 1 Peter 1 and verse 20 who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in the last time for you. Jesus actually came some 2,000 years ago, and he died on the cross. And he himself said he was going to die to redeem us in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. And any common sense person knows he did is a historical fact. Ask anybody in the world you want to come in contact with. And they'll say to you, some unusual person died some 2,000 years ago on a cross. I know he was Christ. And the Bible says he was Christ. He is so number one, it's a historical fact. Number two, there's the factual proof. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21 who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave his, him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. You know one of the most proved facts of all human history? Jesus rose from the dead. That's a proven fact. There's been scientists that went there in the grave of Jesus with all kind of instruments and proved that somebody lay there and died, but it's empty today. And it's been empty ever since Jesus rose from the dead. Now that's a factual proof, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. First, there's a historical fact, but there's also the factual proof. Thirdly, there's experimental proof. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21 again, who by him do believe in God. Let me give you something. I know he lives today. You know why? He lives within me. I've been saved all these years, over 50 years now, been preaching the message that Jesus saves. I've led many, many to Christ for redemption and salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know personally Jesus lives. Amen. That's experimental proof. Here's what I'm saying. Try it. It works. I sat down with a man one time and I was doing my best to get him to understand that Jesus died for his sins. That if he'd asked Jesus to save him, he'd do it. And I was trying to get him to understand it. And I said, let me, let me put it this way. What have you got to lose? A little bit of Trumpitis there. Oh, you all get it through. But anyhow, <laughs> anyhow uh, what I am trying to say is, what have you got to lose? If I'm right... You got eternal life. But if I'm wrong, we're all going to hell anyhow. Amen? And what I know is true. Try it. I never will forget the night that I accept Christ as my Savior. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know everything about God. But a man told me, God said, Thus saith the Lord, Amen. He read it right out of the scriptures that I, as a sinner, and I didn't have proof. Somebody said, you ever seen God? No, but I've seen his handiwork. Amen. And so I know there is one. Have you ever seen Christ? No, but I talked to him this morning. 
and he talked back to me through his word. Don't tell me he ain't live, he ain't alive, he ain't real. I know he is by experimental ways. And I asked you one thing, try it. It works. If you never accepted Christ as your own personal Savior, if you know not Him as your personal Savior, just try it. Listen to this little thing I found. It's not a works that I have been redeemed, but by His blood alone I am set free. One and for all redemption work was finished when Jesus shed His blood on Calvary. No other way is offered for salvation. No work of mine could pay the price of sin. My only hope is in the blood of Jesus. Tis by His blood I have His peace within. I ask, you know, witnessing to people all the time and, and just going around <clears throat> and I love to shop in the grocery stores and things and I'm always whistling and singing little songs and things in my, to myself and, and people are, a lot of times stop me and say, why are you so happy in this world of mess? You know my answer? There's something lives in here didn't used to live there. I got a joy in my heart that I didn't used to have. I got a peace that passes understanding. I don't even understand how I can be happy in this old world, except Jesus lives within me. And he's given me such great hope because, you know what? And I don't want to get into political end of it, but I'll just say this this way. Pelosi, I think, is the Antichrist. But yeah, I'll leave it alone. But uh, I, I look at some of the things that's in this world right now, and I see the mess that the world is in right now. And I see our government. I see everything around us just seem like it's going down the tube. And I go around happy as a little felar, just singing and praising God and going right on through life. I go to bed at night, lay my head down, have the peace of God. I don't worry about dying because I know I have somebody present with the Lord. Don't matter to me. And I see, and I, I tell people all the time, I wish you knew the Christ that I know. I wish you knew the God that I know. You can't buy that. You can't purchase that. Jesus has already done it for you. And he did it on Calvary's tree. And if you read if you read Peter there, what we read, it's by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know why that's so important? Anybody can apply the blood. Anybody. That makes it possible that any old sinner. You ever had some somebody come along and tell you, uh, preacher, go visit this one. You sure ain't gonna win him, Lord. He's too mean. I had a, a lady used to come to our church several years ago and Every time she'd come, she'd come up to me, pray for my husband. He's just mean. He never was mean to her, but he's mean. He'll never get saved. But pray for him, will you, preacher? She kept doing that to one day I went to visit him. I just had to see this guy if he's that mean. And so I went by to see him, and I sat down on him. I took my son-in-law with me, and they will forget it. I went in to visit him and, and, you know, tried to break the ice a little bit. And I said, boy, that's a nice picture on the wall you got there. And I said, your little daughter, she's the cutest little thing. And I talked about different things. And and uh, uh, all of a sudden, there was a Siamese cat behind that couch, jumped up and landed right on top of my head. <laughs> Ain't no joke. I mean, it made the awfulest noise you ever heard. You ever heard a Siamese cat scream? That sounds like a panther, you know? And I don't like cats in the first place. Here he was on top of my head. <laughs> and everything in the world happening. And you know what that man done? He looked right at me and he said, why don't you just cut to the chase? My wife done sent you here to lead me to Christ. Said, okay then. So I took the Bible, sat down with him just as plain as day, and went through the Word of God just like I do any other sinner. Now think about this for just a minute. Here's a wife that said to me, you'll never win him to Christ, but I'd like to see you try. And you know what? Like a little baby. The Word of God got to his heart. The Holy Spirit began to speak to him through his word and drew him to Christ Jesus. And I went right through the Romans road and I said, Sir, would you ask Jesus to come in your life, save your soul? And he did. 
And guess what? Next Sunday here he come, got baptized, sang in the choir, served the Lord with us. Let me tell you something. The blood of Jesus Christ still works. And I know so. And I got the proof. I got the historical proof. I got the factual proof. And I got the experimental proof that Jesus is the Savior. And I can prove it. Amen. But I don't have to prove it. You know why? It's not, it's not received by proof. It's received by faith. And I marvel at people. He said, Preacher, I don't know if I got enough faith to believe. I want you to do something for me. Take the Bible anywhere on any page on any verse of the Bible and tell me how much faith you got to have to be saved. Can anybody do that? Is there any place in there that says you got to have 10% or 50% or 90% faith to be saved? No, it's not. It says just faith, period. You know why that's important? Because the Bible says that God gives every human being a portion of faith. Everybody has a portion of faith. You know why I know that? Because Gunner went and bought him a brand new Chevrolet pickup truck. Now he's got to have faith to go turn that key and think that thing going to start. <laughs> Amen. I told him the other day when he brought it down the house, that don't look like no Ford to me. <laughs> Everybody has faith. Listen to me now. You got faith. Do you understand electricity? I don't. But I ain't going to live in the dark. I go where and got faith that'll come on. Amen. So everybody has a portion of faith. You know why that's so important? It's what you do with the faith that you got. Do you believe that uh, if you carve your statue and make it look some like some scarecrow and you bow down to that thing and worship it, do you believe that that, you're going to exercise your faith in that to get you to heaven? Do you exercise your faith in, if I give so much to the church? One of the richest men I ever knew personally, a good friend of mine, <clears throat> and he gave us all the building of the blocks of the cement and the seal and everything for this church and my home and things to build all of this. And I went to him. He, he was a Jew, a, a, a Orthodox Jew, and just a good friend. I went to him right after I got saved in my Bible, and I sat down in his office, and I said, Sir, I want you to go to heaven with me. And he said, what makes you think I ain't going to heaven? I go to, uh, what do they call it, uh, synagogue once a year? Okay, then you must be fit for heaven, amen? No, I didn't. I said, let me take the Bible and show you how to be saved. I went through it with him. And he said, Mr. Strong, I do good things. He said, I help build people's houses, and he did. I know a lot of people. He built their house and gave it to them. And he helped poor people all the time. And he thought he put his faith in what he was doing good to take him to heaven. What are you putting your faith in? What are you exercising in? I put my faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and that alone. I don't add to it and I don't take from it. Jesus, if I go to hell, it's going to be your fault. And I say that as reverently as I know how to put it. I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that I am and everything that I hope to be as a Christian is in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, I can know by time alone, Jesus, God said he made salvation for me. I experience salvation. I know it's real. And I know I'm saved. Amen. So you know, you can know, if you want to know. Stand with me, please. Heavenly Father, I love to make it simple because a man made it simple to me when I heard it for the first time. He just told me Jesus loved me. And Jesus died for me. And he shed his blood. And one drop of that heavenly blood would cleanse me from all my sins. But Jesus shed it all. 
that he might die for the sins of the whole world. But it's only good to those that receive it by faith. And I pray today, if there is somebody that's listening or somebody here present today that does not trust the blood of Jesus Christ and that alone to save them from their soul, from their sins, that you'll cause them to today by the wooing of the Holy Spirit. Bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. While we got our heads bowed,